We hear so much and there's so many studies showing that great sleep, quality nutrition, good social interactions, avoiding chronic stress are important for everything. Reduce, they're related to Alzheimer's, they're related to ADHD. Sleep, not don't stress too much or too long, good social connection, avoid toxic people, eat good food, not too much processed food. All of that modulates your brain function, but it doesn't mediate or change anything directly. It's setting a foundation of what's possible. So we should all be doing those things, and especially people who have TBI. When dopamine is higher in your brain and body, when you've deployed it through excitement or pharmacology or otherwise, it tends to narrow your focus and make you seek more of it in that general theme that you happen to be focused on. Could be anything. That's the scary thing about dopamine. What can you do to control it and to reduce it? Well, for those of you that are engaging in habits that are healthy, maybe that doesn't require reducing dopamine. How do you define healthy versus unhealthy? Well, I think the simplest way to define addiction, at least by my mind, is that addiction is a progressive narrowing of the things that bring you pleasure, and a good life is a progressive expansion of the things that bring you pleasure. A rather simple definition, and yet when we think about the biology of dopamine, you know, do dopamine is not unique to one pursuit. It's not unique to pursue the pursuit of sex or the pursuit of warmth when you're cold or, or cool environments when you're too warm or food or social media. It's just a dumb molecule that puts you into this forward state of mass, small visual aperture, and a kind of obsessive-like nature. What can you do to counter that? Well, the best thing to do is to not get into that state too long, but if you do, the best thing you can do is to try and switch off that system, not through pharmacology, but by not pursuing more dopamine. The day after a big event, the so-called postpartum depression, named of course because of true postpartum after the delivery of a child, it's quite common for people to get very, very depressed. There's a lot of neurochemical and hormonal adjustments that are occurring, but different types of postpartum depression occur after a big party, the Monday blues, the Sunday blues, is typically when dopamine starts to drop. I always tell people, just wait. I'm telling somebody very close to me right now, just wait four months, four months, four months. And also spend as much time with that person as possible. I don't know what this deal is about not spending as much time with people. I think people are afraid that the dopamine wave pool is just gonna pull them both under. I think they call that the escalator model of relationship where you just sort of find yourself in the relationship because you went through the stages without actually deciding on them in any event. Four months seems to be the stage in which the dopamine crescendo starts to relax a little bit. Not in a long distance relationship, however. We know this, right? Anticipation is dopamine, that positive anticipation. I don't think that you want to use pharmacology to turn off the dopamine system, but for people that have a hard time sleeping and that are really in a state of agitation and constantly obsessing, the psychiatrist, one of the oldest and most effective treatments, is that the psychiatrist, and this does have to be prescribed, will use a very, very low dose of a dopamine receptor blocker like haloperidol, which is a used to treat schizophrenia, very low dose to shut down the obsession component. Smart, well-educated psychiatrists know this as a useful tool, but this is a one-time thing with a very low dose because having your dopamine blocked sucks. It does not feel good, but not being able to sleep and being in an obsessive mode also sucks. Now, this is important because when you go out in the morning, even if it's not at sunrise, but it's close to sunrise, or you look at the sun in the evening, what you'll see is yellow-blue contrast or orange. That's not the color of light that you're going to see when the sun is overhead. Now, this also is really interesting because the viewing low solar angle sunlight in the morning and in the evening is most effective because of those yellow-blue contrasts. Now, here's the really wild thing. Those circuits that set your levels of alertness and sleep, yes, they respond best to yellow-blue contrast, but what that tells us is crazy. What that means is that color vision was probably not related to color perception first because all of that is completely subconscious. The pathways that do this are present in people who are pattern vision blind. So what do I mean? I mean that color vision likely evolved from a need to synchronize your internal state with the external world and the best stimulus in the outside world to do that is yellow-blue contrast. In other words, 
Our ability to detect color was first and foremost, and we understand this based on evolutionary genomics and so forth, to extract time of day information, not color of fruit or color of skin or anything like that. That's all secondary, which is wild and crazy. And this is yet another example of the way we think things work is not the way they work. The most powerful way to anchor your brain and body in time is indeed viewing light, sunlight at consistent times of day. That's not something I made up. We, we know this based on a lot of work that dates back to the 1930s. The second most powerful stimulus is going to be movement and changes in body temperature. In particular, increases in body temperature tend to make us alert and decreases in body temperature tend to make us sleepy. Body temperature drops one to three degrees to get us into sleep. Why does a cold shower wake you up? Adrenaline is released and believe it or not, your body is heating up internally to combat that cold, unless you make yourself hypothermic. Hot baths to get sleepy, cold showers, ice baths, etc., to wake up. So what do you do? You want to try and use as many of these things, light, temperature, exercise, food, when you eat, is typically associated with waking. And then the other one is social activity and rhythms. Now, the, the discombobulated person is gonna be the person that has not aligned to these things in a consistent way. So while schedules vary, and Andrew, I don't know your exact schedule, what I can say is if you suddenly go from daytime behavior and sleeping at night to the so-called vampire shift, as it's called in the military, and suddenly you're up in the middle of the night and you're sleeping during the day, then when you come off that shift, what you want to do is try and combine as many of those same things at one time. So it would be get your sunlight, so go jogging without your sunglasses, drink your coffee, engage with other people and communicate, eat a meal afterwards, or as the case may be before. Try and bring as many of those things together at the same time of day for a few days and pretty soon your system will map around that. So the reason I encourage for those of us that are not doing shift work, to try and be fairly consistent about sunlight viewing is it sets in motion everything else that's correct. But if in terms of timing of eating, appetite will follow, when your alert will follow, you'll start to learn your own rhythms. When you can't control your schedule, try and combine as many of those cues, again, light, temperature, exercise, food, social engagement into one period of time and try and lock that into a more or less a one or two hour period or plus or minus one or two hours at a particular time of day for at least two or three days. And your schedule, meaning your internal clocks will lock to that.